Hi everyone, welcome back to Dr. Hans Classroom. So in the past 10 days or so, almost all of the news on COVID has been about the Omicron variant. Now I've already done some updates on Omicron variant, but for my regular weekly update or videos on COVID, I would like to focus more on a broader topics related to the pandemic. And as you see in the title here today, it's about Ivermectin. Now, in fact, this video is a viewer's request video for me to react to Dr. John Campbell's most recent uh, video on Ivermectin. Now, I'm sure a lot of you, if not all of you, know Dr. John Campbell and have already probably watched this video, right? Now, instead of reacting to a video like a typical YouTuber, I would like to call this a commentary to Dr. John Campbell's assessment on Ivermectin and based on pharmacokinetics and pharmaceutics point of view. Now, if you stick until the end of this video, you will find out why I think this drug deserves more attention from the research community. So without further ado, let's get started. So very briefly, if you have not watched Dr. John Campbell's video, his video referenced multiple peer-reviewed papers describing how ivermectin showed binding interaction to several proteins key to the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, viral cycle in vitro, and in computer modeling experiments. So there is no dispute on Dr. Campbell's ivermectin video in that regard. Dr. Campbell also referenced the term pharmacodynamics of ivermectin. But to be more precise, from a pharmaceutical scientist's perspective, pharmacodynamics most refer to how the drug affects the body. So how ivermectin can affect a viral protein is more like a mechanism of action. But what I would like to focus in this video is to look at the drug's effect from three other pharmaceutical science aspects. And number one, the pharmacokinetics profile. Now this refers to how the body affects the drug, and that is what most matters in clinical stage. In fact, many preclinical compounds would never get a chance to see the light outside the lab was because they had failed to survive our body's natural ability to eliminate foreign chemicals. And here is an earlier major paper that showed ivermectin at 5 micromolar concentration could significantly inhibit SARS-CoV-2 viral replication in an in vitro study. And the IC50, or the concentration that can inhibit half of the growth of the virus, is at 2 micromolar. That earlier paper generated a lot of buzz, and that led to many other studies, and this study actually used the available population pharmacokinetic model to predict how much of a given dose of ivermectin would reach the lung, where the drug would work to inhibit the virus. This study factors in parameters such as plasma protein binding, which is essential because when ivermectin is in the bloodstream, a large amount of it is bound to a protein called albumin. Now, when a drug is bind to albumin, it cannot leave the bloodstream and certainly cannot bind to other cellular targets to produce a pharmacological effect. Now, this study concluded that a 10 times higher than the approved dose of ivermectin, that is at 120 mg given as a single dose, was still unlikely to reach the IC50 in the lungs and therefore has a low probability of success in the treatment of COVID. Now here is something interesting. If we extrapolate the model and assume the distribution of ivermectin is a linear relationship to the dose, then at 30 times higher the approved dose at 360 mg, which would likely reach the IC50 concentration in the lung. So the question is, would a dose equal or close to 360 mg be able to inhibit SARS-CoV-2 virus replication in the lung? Now, unfortunately, the highest safe ivermectin dose currently published in the literature was at 2 mg per kilogram, which would be 180 mg for a 90 kg adult, which is about 200 pounds. 
And then you will ask me, has there been any studies testing high dose ivermectin in treating COVID? Now there are at least two studies that test the high dose. The first study was done by a group in Argentina, tested 0.6 milligram per kilogram per day of ivermectin, and found no differences in clinical evolution at day seven and day 30 between treatment and placebo groups. And the second study was done by a group in Italy, and the study is still in preprint. They tested single dose ivermectin 0.6 mg per kilogram for five days, and a single dose of ivermectin 1.2 mg per kilogram for five days, compared to placebo. Now the study did not find any significant difference between treatment and placebo. Perhaps those two studies' results were not what you were expecting. Just don't get mad at me yet. According to this ivermectin summary webpage, which has a collective of ivermectin research papers, so far 67, and studies with much smaller standard dose appear to have some benefits. So, what could be the possible explanation? This comes to my point number two, the off-target effect. And here is my hypothesis. Now, I hypothesize that ivermectin's clinical effect in COVID is not only related to the direct modulation of the viral cycle in lung tissue. And here are my rationales. First, because it is pretty clear that the lung tissue ivermectin concentration is not likely to reach IC50 in any of the ivermectin studies so far. But COVID is also not a typical disease limited only to the lung. More and more research is suggesting COVID is a complex multi-system disorder. So to focus drug concentration on the lung tissue alone may not be sufficient to understand the whole picture. What is more is that ivermectin has long been studied for its off-target effects beyond treating parasitic infections. This review article published in 2017 summarized all of the available data or preclinical data at the time showing ivermectin interacts with different targets and has effects on a wide range of diseases. Another review article published in 2017 also summarized how ivermectin had shown positive effects in different preclinical disease models. Now, these past studies have provided many leads that make ivermectin worthy of more investigations. And point number three, it is related to generic drug formulation. This topic is directly related to pharmaceutical science, and I have not seen any YouTube doctors talk about it yet, so I may be the first to talk about it. Here I'm focusing on generic drug development in the US as this is what I'm most familiar with. In the US, generic drug companies do not need to do clinical studies to prove safety and effectiveness to produce and market their products. All they need to do is to prove their generic drugs are bioequivalent to the reference product, which is the brand name drug. The bioequivalent is established by showing that a generic drug product and the brand name version are similar in terms of their concentrations over time at the site of action. Generally, the testing participants would take the generic drug and the plasma concentration of the drug is measured multiple times to generate a drug concentration profile curve like the one you see here. The red line is the generic drug concentration, and the blue line is the brand name drug. The two curves do not have to be exactly the same. The US FDA and most country allows the concentration curve to vary between 80 to 120 geometric mean ratio. So here would be an example. Both generic A and generic B would be considered bioequivalent to the brand drug. But the biggest problem is that generic A and generic B could have a variation up to 40 GMR. Now that could have a clinical impact on the patients. And I remember when I was a pharmacy intern at a pharmacy more than a decade ago, there were patients often complaining that certain makers' generic drugs did not work for them and demand to have drugs from specific generic makers. 
Now, why would there be such a difference? The issue is related to the term formulation. Drug manufacturers press the active ingredient and other fillers into oral tablets. Now, the choice of fillers could affect how fast the drug dissolves in the stomach and how fast the active ingredients get absorbed into the bloodstream. And different generic manufacturers may likely to have a small variation in their tablet fillers. The problem is that most of the Ivermectin studies were done by clinicians at the hospitals with whichever generic ivermectin they had on hand. Could the difference in ivermectin tablets formulation make a difference? That is also a question worthy of more investigation. And lastly, could a reformulation of ivermectin into inhaling form generate more consistent clinical results? That is again a topic worthy of. Looking into the bottom line is that science is always about raising questions, generating hypotheses, and rigorously testing the hypothesis to prove or disprove that. Now, certainly there are many more questions surrounding ivermectin, which is more than I could think of in this video. Personally, I think Merck being the original maker. And not investigating or reformulating ivermectin for a different purpose is a real loss of opportunity here, because under FDA regulations, a reformulation of an old drug with a new indication can be sold as a brand new drug with a good price. Now, even though the NIH and FDA are not changing their position on ivermectin, now FDA still say no ivermectin. And NIH just say either recommend for or against at this point. The academia appears to be more open to testing ivermectin. I'm posting the link again to a nationwide ivermectin study for everyone who is eligible in the U.S. and interested in participating. That is all for this video. And again, I would like to emphasize this video is for educational purposes only. And I hope all of you have learned something new today. Now, meanwhile, please stay safe and healthy, and I'll see you in my next video. And take care. Bye.